with you. Yes, Nobody. sir. I got it. I didn't, I thought you were looking for me. I'm looking for you. I'm looking for you. Um, my question is, why are the prices on gas increasing? You know? You know what I mean? Hey, man. He obviously has a car. Hey, look. It's complicated. You'd fully understand it. I'm going to give you a brief answer. And remembering that famous admonition of, of, of Samuel Clemens, he said, all generalizations are false, including this one. But I'm going to give you it as quick and as straight as I can. Number one. Number one. The international, to use a fancy word, exigencies of the, of the oil market are amazing. For example, every time there's talk about war with Iran, a major oil producer, because Iran says if there is war, they will take out the Saudi oil fields and the Bahraini fields, they will attack them. Every investor, the big guys who make these judgments about the futures, it's called the futures market, who say, well, look, we've got to hedge against that happening, so we've got to assume that oil may go to, it's now high, artificially high at over $100 a barrel. It could go to 200 a barrel, and so the future, and all that, what it does, it drives up the price of oil in anticipation, even when there is enough supply. And so what's going on now are two things that no president, Democrat or Republican control. One is called the Arab Spring. You all know about that. What happened in Libya, what happened in Tunisia, what happened in Egypt, what happened in Bahrain is happening now, etc. Now they are the oil, some of the biggest oil producers in the world. So when the war in Libya occurred, Libya was a producer of a significant amount of oil. When the rebels attacked and the world supported them, that oil came to a screeching halt. So that was a lot less oil on the international market. I'm treating you, this answer like I would if I were answering and meet the press, so I hope I'm not offending anybody by just going straight to it. But here's the deal. Oil is what they call fungible. It means that it has a world price. There's not a price for oil in Saudi Arabia and a price for oil in Canada and a price for oil in Latin America. It's all one price because you can go anywhere and pick it up. So it's all the same price. Now, what's happened is that as this discontents occurred, no one knows where that Arab Spring is going to go. Let me give you an example. Egypt. Egypt had this revolution. The revolution occurred. They threw out a dictator. They threw out a long line of folks. The military looked like they were in charge. Now they have their elections. And the Muslim Brotherhood and the Sephalists have won an overwhelming majority. Now they're about to form a government. They're about to elect a president. So what happens if they elect a president that is as hostile to the West as, uh, I'm not predicting this, but what happens if they elect a, that's as hostile to the West as Iran is to the West? What does that do? What happens in the other countries? What happens in Bahrain, where they have an overwhelming minority of, or majority of Shia, and yet the Sunnis run Bahrain, a major oil producer? And you can go down the list. No one knows. We're trying to manage these outcomes in ways that will give some stability. But the world markets, they don't think about that. They just hedge against the bets. It's like a little bit like saying, okay, you know, the forecast is 30% chance of rain. Well, some of you would bring an umbrella. Most of you would say, ah, 70% in my life. Guess what? The market's 30%. It's going to rain. I better take them. I better go buy an umbrella. And so it's kind of what they do. That drives the price of oil up. Not manipulating. It's not these guys. There are manipulators. It's not these guys out there saying, we're going to make a lot of money now. We're going to do this. It has to do with the world market. Now, we knew that when we came to office. That's why since we've been in office, let me, let me give you a few numbers. There are more oil and gas rigs working in the United States of America right now today than all the rest of the world combined. Let me say that to you again. More oil and gas rigs 
in America than all the rest of the world combined. When you hear about we should drill more, we are environmentally drilling everywhere that we can. We are producing almost 700,000 barrels of oil more at seven, right? 700,000? Is that correct? 650,000 more barrels of oil per day than the day we came into office. Second thing the president realized we have to do is not just enough to produce more energy, we have to be more energy efficient. So the president has doubled with the support of the Congress, well, not all the Congress, but the president has doubled the mileage requirement for American automobiles to 54 miles a gallon by the end of the, this, uh, this decade. That will save people at the gas pump $1.7 trillion. That's hundreds of billions, tens of billions of barrels of oil not consumed because that's the biggest driver of energy costs. The third thing the president has said, and this is where we have a big, we have a big debate with the other team on that. They didn't think we should double mileage. They didn't think we should insist cars get more mileage. We're of the view that we have the technology to maintain performance and significantly increase mileage, and it's in the national interest to do so. The, second, the fourth thing we did was the president came along and he said, look, we have to do all of the above. We have to take advantage of all the oil we have in the United States and off our shore that we can soundly get. We have, to we have 100 years of natural gas, shale oil, below the surface of the continental United States. We know we can get it, but we have to do it environmentally soundly. There's a thing called fracking. They gotta go crack the rock in order to get it out. You can environmentally do that well, and you can environmentally do it poorly. If you do it poorly, you use up the water aquifer, you create, in some cases, the argument is earthquakes, a whole lot of things. But we are spending a lot of time and money figuring out how to do it environmentally sound way. But here's the big difference we have with our friends. We think we should be investing in the energy of the future. Alternative energy, renewable energy, biofuels, solar energy, wind energy, <laughs> nuclear. And folks, I want to remind you. I want to remind you of one thing. You say, well, wait a minute. The government shouldn't be involved in that. The government shouldn't be subsidizing startups of these organizations. The government, guess what? Why do you think for years and years and years from the beginning, we gave oil companies gigantic tax breaks? What was the reason to do it? To encourage them to go drill. Because for every hole they dig, they come up, they come up dry of, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's more than they come up with oil. And it costs a lot of money to drill. So we said to the oil companies for the last 50 years, we're going to give you a tax break. But here's the point. Oil companies don't need encouragement to drill. They've made more money than God in the last couple of years. They, I mean, seriously. It's astronomical profit. I'm not criticizing the profit, but it's astronomical. But our, our guys in the other team, instead of us spending money to help startups in areas like solar and wind, what's happened? They want to continue to give a four and a half billion dollar tax break to the largest oil companies in America. They need that tax break like I need another, anyway, they don't need that tax break. <laughs> so again, it's about show me your budget and I'll tell you what you value. And my question is, the only way we can avoid what will happen again, oil prices will come down, gas prices will come down, whether it's in two months or a year, whenever they do, they'll, they'll come down, sure as the devil, they'll come down. But guess what? The next crisis, what happens, what would happen, for example, it didn't happen, what would happen if Putin, all of a sudden the opposition said he did this in an election or that, and there was chaos in Russia? Russia is a major oil producer, major. They supply almost all the gas for Europe, and they supply a significant amount of the oil. If there is political 
disruption in Russia in the future, and I'm not predicting that to the press. That is not a prediction. I want to make it clear. It's an illustration. It's an illustration. If that were to happen, what happens? Now, all that gas and oil going from Russia to Europe and going there, so guess what? All the European countries, now they go to Saudi Arabia. And now they go to Venezuela and they go to Canada. And what happens? There's more people competing for that same amount of oil and the price goes up. The only way to protect us from this is to get energy independent. And there's no way to get energy independent unless you do all of the above, including solar, wind, geothermal, and the rest. And that's why I get confused by our friends who don't think we should do any of that and continue to generate tax incentives for oil companies who are making over a billion dollars a year. For, for I, I, that, that, that's the part we don't get, but it's a real difference. Now look, two, two, two more things on energy. One, we are now, we are now producing more domestic energy than any time we have in, 16, in, in eight years, and we are less dependent on foreign oil than any time in the last 16 years. 50% reduction. We're below 50%. And so the only way to keep it from happening again, it will spike again in one year, three years, five years, because of international arrangement, is to make sure that we are able to say we don't need your oil. We are okay.